ended up um, learning it the easy way by marrying Eddie Knows the Truth Doctor. <laughs> That's actually correct. Right? Um, and um, so uh, then she realised that every second kid in Australia has nasal allergies. Who would agree with this? Right? In Australia, we're, we're a nation of sporting people or migrants that actually don't belong here. Uh, and as a result, every second kid has got a broken nose or can't breathe through them. And what that means to us as orthodontists um, is that they develop an open mouth posture, tongue not doing its job, a uh, very narrow cut. Yes, no? Uh, and you could send them off to um, an ear, nose, and throat doctor and do the adenoids and tonsils. You could widen their palate, but if you're not treating their allergic rhinitis, it keeps coming back again and again and again. Uh, so, previous methods um, of treating that were very complicated and involved many, many sessions. Um, and Susie has come up with a very good way, A, to diagnose, um, and, and B, to, to treat. And that's what I want to share with you. Uh, whether you're a, how many speech pathologists do we have? Okay, welcome. So speech pathologists, you know, if you keep like, like that, it's going to be very hard for them to do the exercises you want. Absolutely. Yep. Right. Um, so I think we're all in this together, and the, and the link is the palate, right? If you have a, a narrow palate, um, you're going to have more crowding, it's going to worsen the function, uh, and it has a role and effect with the breathing. So I think whether you're an orthodontist expanding the jaw, whether you're a speech pathologist changing tongue posture, uh, it all comes down to clearing of the nose, all right? So I'll, I'll hand over to Susie. She has rooms in Bella Vista, where I send all my Parramatta patients, and in uh, uh, Bondi Junction, where I send all my Ramwick patients, and I occasionally have to um, put my Shire patients in a taxi to send them to Bondi Junction because they feel that if you cross Tom Ugly's bridge, you need a visa. And that's not true. <laughs> Is that right? So please motivate Susie to set up rooms in the Shire. I think Rose Lands is coming. Is that close? Good. Good. Yeah. Reasonably. But, uh, okay, I'll hand over to you. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. That was, that was a lovely intro, and I fear that he's probably covered most of my lecture. Um, <laughs> in a couple of sentences. Um, he's been a great mentor, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, so it was always really hard to prepare a lecture for another crowd of you know, different professionals. Um, I generally am a GP educator and I can see that there's speech paths here and clearly we've got the rest as dentists. Is that right? Hands up. Or am I functional? Any, yes? Um, is there any other professionals that we've forgotten that want to raise their hand and say, I'm that? The whole point, I suppose, is that um, there's a different group of professionals, and I apologise if this is too basic or too detailed at some points. Um, I'm going to do my best to kind of give a very good overview of mouth breathing in children. I wasn't going to focus too much on allergies because that can be a little bit boring, but I certainly will include allergies in it. Um, I've been doing this now, I've been doing a GP for 15 years, but really focusing in on the airway for the last five years. And as Derek said, I completely fell into it. And um, I developed uh, working alongside an ENT pathways that would essentially mean that patients uh, could be seen quicker. And uh, quite often what would happen is I would see the patient even before they would see the ENT and I would end up managing the patient medically and they wouldn't even have to see the ENT. And most of that was because the patients had a huge amount of allergic disease. And so that was the beginnings and the basis of developing a GP working alongside uh, a specialist, which we call a shared care model. And that shared care model, we've now developed lots of different versions of it, and I've trialled it in lots of different places. Um, you know, GPs working alongside an orthodontist. I've actually worked, uh, had the pleasure of working at Full Face in Randwick, um, which was brilliant because it really enabled me to see a lot of pathology, specifically with um, oral health pathology. I've worked alongside ENTs, I've worked alongside uh, G other GPs, and I've really developed, I hope, uh, a lot of these brilliant sort of pathways that increase access for patients to get seen with mouth breathing syndrome quickly and accessibly, basically at virtually no cost, um, which I think is a huge relief to a lot of uh, patients because they're running around everywhere and there's huge amounts of uh, costs in seeing lots of different specialists. So if we can centralise care, and I'll talk about that a lot, 
um, centralising care has huge amounts of benefits for uh, patient outcomes. So my, my absolute core purpose at the moment is I would love to not only nationally upskill, but I'm actually aiming to globally upskill uh, primary care workforces in a team care approach to mouth breathing syndrome in children. Um, and I'm hoping that, um, you know, being at lectures like this, it will begin a tidal wave of these change agents who are committed to a teamwork approach because the siloed model of care with you know, GPs here and dentists here and ENTs here doing their own little thing with a lack of communication, it's got to end. It, it's just got to end. And it, there is no reason why we can't communicate better and have better communication exchanges and actually work as a team. And um, I honestly feel that we need to break down these walls between GPs and ENTs, etc., as well as the, the oral health professionals and start working more as a team in the private world, um, which is hopefully where, you know, outside hospital essentially. So um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an um, approach essentially to what I teach my registrars, my GP registrars, which is the 5C approach to, I call this mouth breathing syndrome because um, it really is a collection of signs and symptoms um, with multiple etiologies. So you might see it as MBS, that's not the Medicare benefit schedule, it's just <laughs> mouth breathing children. And um, we will do what's called an IPL activity, which is in your, um, in your little party packs. Um, in the Australian Allergy Centre uh, folder, there is some um, module activities. And right at the end of the lecture, we're going to hopefully pull it all together and I'm going to get you guys just to work in partners and see if you can come up with some answers and hopefully some brave soul will put their hand up and share their answers with everybody. And um, today is really me testing the waters for um, something that I've talked to Derek about um, and I know that he's definitely doing interprofessional education and learning workshops but I would love to be able to uh, get Derek to peer review my upcoming interprofessional education and learning workshop, which is basically a one-day program um, building the relationships, working relationships with actual GPs, with oral health professionals out there to increase referrals. So um, basically when we look at, we look at mouth breathing, it's, it's not normal, okay? It's a pathology, full stop. And in, in fact, I pretty much say mouth breathing is a pathology until proven otherwise. That's my new motto. Um, it, it can be habitual. Obviously, you can clear the airway and there can be uh, some habitual mouth breathing. But generally speaking, we really must presume that it is an obstruction of some kind, an upper airway resistance of some kind, um, first up. Um, and unfortunately, when we, we don't breathe through the nose and the, that nasal airflow is interrupted, there's this whole cascade of effects that happen with, uh, with the face and with the rest of our body. Um, we know that obviously there is abnormalities with craniofacial growth and you guys will uh, see more about that later and I'm sure you guys work with craniofacial abnormalities and dental and orthodontic problems all the time. But we also know that there is poor posture um, they don't sleep well, and as a consequence of not sleeping well, we'll talk more about the fact that they do develop you know, learning and developmental difficulties as well. Um, there is also a huge relationship with their exacerbation of asthma, and that's on two levels. First of all, we know that the allergic rhinitis and asthma are intrinsically linked. It's in fact what we call a unified airway syndrome. What that means is, if you're allergic here, you're generally allergic here. And unfortunately, we've segregated the nose and the lungs for such a long time that the World Health Authority is really telling us now, the WHO is telling us now, look, stop segregating them and let's call it the unified airway. And that makes a whole lot of sense because you will actually see that if you treat the nose, asthma improves. And that's pretty much, in, you know, particularly with steroid nasal sprays, we've been, we've been seeing that over and over again in num a number of studies that if you actually treat with intranasal steroids in the nose for their allergic rhinitis, there is a reduction in the amount of asthma exacerbations or asthma presentations to the emergency department. So we do know that they are definitely linked, not only through the allergy side of things, but if your nose is blocked, that means that essentially you're breathing in through your mouth cold, dry, unfiltered air. And if you're breathing in cold, dry, unfiltered air because you've lost the function of your nose, um, then that can actually in itself make asthma worse. So irrespective if it's just allergic rhinitis or turbinate hypertrophy or a deviated septum, if their nose is blocked, 
quite often their asthma can uh, be a lot more unstable anyway. The aim, we digressed, uh, but the aim of the whole of the management of mouth breathing syndrome in children is really to clear the airway. And what we designed at the Australian Allergy Centre and through my work was that a GP can clear the airway potentially medically, and if that fails, then we can then refer on surgically and we can talk about how the EMT will obviously clear the airway. Um, so the aim is to make sure they can breathe appropriately through the nose so that we can restore nasal breathing, which means then that we can correct the tongue position. And tongue thrusting is a huge problem, um, particularly after um, the ENT has actually cleared the airway. There is a lot of kids that are still walking around with their abnormal tongue function and they're still not breathing through the nose. And the, the, the element of nasal rebreathing, I can't stress enough uh, as part of the team approach, is that we can't just sort of clear the airway and then get the orthodontics and then not, not keep going with their management. It is really important that follow up, that, that we actually check they're actually breathing through the nose. Um, and that's when that habitual mouth breathing can sometimes occur. Um, and very importantly, the aim of management is to manage the comorbidities. And we're gonna talk a lot about the comorbidities of mouth breathing and why this is such a complex and chronic problem. So how do we do this? Um, well, mouth breathing in children needs to be early intervention, and a coordinated response, and most importantly, interdisciplinary teamwork. So that's what we're going to be learning about today with the 5C approach. So I'm hoping that that more of these red doors are going to spot, you know, uh, appear everywhere. And these these red doors are the special skills doors of upskilled GPs who have actually trained a little bit more in airway. And when I mean airway, it really means the ability for a GP to identify and manage allergic disease and also identify and manage an obstructed upper airway. And really all it is is a couple of extra skills. I train it in six months uh, to competency level for these GPs and I would hope that very soon that could be a, uh, a, a there can be a rise of the national minimum standard for GPs to be able to do this. So that if you see a mouth breathing child, you can refer it direct to a GP rather than thinking, oh, where am I gonna send it to an ENT or speech path or where is this child gonna go? So um, we're gonna be looking at the cases later and one of the cases is gonna be this child here um, where this is a standard sort of, these are walk-in curriculums. These are the sort of things that I see all the time. This is a child where mom's come in to see the GP and said, look, I just wanna refer her to the speech path. Teacher thinks that my kid's got a lisp. Okay, now if we go back, oh, we can't go back, but if we, we really can't go back, yes we can. If we go back to the doors, what I'm going to be showing you is that if you went through the red door, how the outcomes will change for these children, as opposed to all the other potential doors there. Um, this is Marco, he's another mouth breathing child, but he's attending because Mum thinks he's just got another repeat Bertie. And we'll be looking at Jack as well. Jack's come in because he's really disruptive in class. Mum's worried about his hyperactivity and poor concentration. She thinks he needs a blood test. Maybe he's got ADHD. Maybe he needs to see a psychiatrist, etc., etc. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to those cases later. And hopefully when we look at those cases, you can use the 5C approach to see exactly what's the best way to manage them. So I think you should all be looking back and thinking, okay, well, what, what is my role and responsibility in, in a mouth breathing child? You know, well, we do need to work out what's causing their mouth breathing. Then we need to work out who we should be seeing. Who should I be referring this to? Should it be a GP? Well, not many GPs kind of know about this. They may not really even know what tongue thrusting is or anything about a malocclusion. Probably not a good choice. Um, but then you think, well, I'll send it straight to the ENT. But then if you send it straight to the ENT, they're probably going <coughs> to operate. And then what's going to happen afterwards? Is there going to be follow-up? Is there going to be any management of allergies? What's going to happen from there? So I can understand there's a lot of dilemma about who you should be referring them to first and when you should be referring them. The question that you should also be asking is, what might be the consequences of not comprehensively managing them? So if we do go down the avenue of just referring to an ENT or just referring to a sleep doctor, what's the consequence of this child not being managed in a team environment and being looked at comprehensively? So um, this is just a, a quote that I, I picked up somewhere. Where was it? 
uh, a value of team-based healthcare, which really sort of sums it up beautifully, that, that nowadays patients are not being looked after just by one health professional, and that this complex and fragmented healthcare system means that we really need to work in, in, in an, an effective team. And one of the things that I really push is about communication. And, and a lot of my workshops really focus on, we do competency-based education frameworks where we actually, I do you know, workshops where I sit with GPs and make them do um, fire drill communications where we actually just practice and practice and practice like a, a role play because we've really got to get communication right, we've got to get letter writing skills right, we've got to get referral letters right, reports right, we've got to know how to actually have a communication exchange with our, 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 our professionals around us. And I think if we can actually perfect those communication exchanges and make it happen properly, then I think we're going to find that everything works a lot easier, particularly if you know what your job is and what your responsibility is. So, to treat this emerging issue, I do want to credit a couple of people that I've learned from. Obviously, Derek, Rochelle McPherson, or my functional therapist I've worked with a lot. Obviously, Dr. Peacock and Dr. Barachi, ENT. And they've really taught me a lot about um, how to manage this in a coordinated fashion. So the intention today is really just to introduce you to this interdisciplinary team approach and to demonstrate how integrating this team care approach in these classic cases will improve patient outcomes. So this is what the future is. I believe it's about team care. But team care just doesn't happen. You don't, you just, you don't co-locate with each other and then all of a sudden we work smoothly. Unfortunately, you actually have to learn how to work in teams and that's one of the big things that I'm trying to push. And my objective over the next couple of years is to actually train individuals to work properly in teams on a practical level. And IPL, which stands for Interdisciplinary interdisciplinary or interprofessional education and learning is, a, is an evidence-based um, method that is integral to how they feel that these healthcare teams should work. We actually need to be sitting here like we are right now and learning together and sitting here and actually doing modules together and activities together and actually sharing our, um, our knowledge. So that's my ambition, um, hopefully I'm going to make that happen, and that is to create this global blueprint for interdisciplinary team care, and mouth breathing syndrome is definitely one of the first places that I'll be starting. So we're going to be learning, um, hopefully by the end of this module, when you see a mouth breathing child, you'll be able to look at the clues and the cues um, of what actually shows that they've got dysfunctional breathing, Look, understand what the major causes are, uh, know what checks to arrange or what checks are going to occur for this child, um, what complications could arise if we don't treat or uh, what complications could there be right now that we need to be aware of and the specific care that's required and who should be involved in that particular care at the moment. So first we might start with the clues and the cues. This way. So I think, I think it's important that we avoid missing the really classical signs of the dysfunctional breather because they're often just staring you right in the face. So let's start making this a little interactive. I don't want to pick on anyone in particular, but I'd love for someone just to stand up really quickly and grab the pointer with me and point out three features that they can see straight away of dysfunctional breathing. There you go. And, oh, no, open mouth. Perfect. Narrow nasal um, alabasis. Perfect. Droopy, um, venous, probably venous pulling under the eyes. Perfect. And type of face and vertical growth pattern. Perfect. You should take the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually I, an awful boy. Oh, well, that would make sense. <laughs> so the pattern recognition is, is obviously very important. And we've, we recognise that this is the adenoid facies. But I think what people really need to realise is that the adenoid is one cause of obstruction, but allergic rhinitis is giving pretty much the same facies as well. So irrespective if it's adenoid or allergy, sorry if I'm in front of you, adenoid or allergy, it is still causing the exact same appearance of this child. And it's a very classical appearance that I'm trying desperately to teach GPs to recognise because they don't seem to be able to recognise it as much as what the orthodontists and dentists do. They're very, very good at recognising open mouth breathing and mouth breathing disorder, unlike the GPs. So when I, kind, when I take my history, I really focus on these five key areas. So if you really just want a cheat guide to what are the best questions to ask 
to work out the cause of mouth breathing syndrome, then I usually start with do you snore first of all, because mouth breathing syndrome is sitting on a spectrum. It's sitting on a spectrum between mouth breathing here and obstructive sleep apnea over here. And so what your aim is to kind of work out how severe their sleep breathing disorder is. And obviously if they're snoring, that is going to be more severe. So we need to ask if they're snoring or whether or not they've got their mouth open just at night or whether or not they've got their mouth open during the day as well. And very often, patients will not recognise that they're mouth breathing. And so one of the things that I tell people to, to try is to simply put your mouth open and or show a picture of a child with a mouth breathing and say, do you sleep with your mouth like this? Or show a child with a mouth breathing and that for whatever reason they recognise it better. But if you just ask them, is your nose blocked? I'll guarantee you they won't say that their nose is blocked. So it's really important that sometimes you have a visual cue because they won't pick it up. In terms of allergy, one in five children have allergic rhinitis. It is prevalent and it is growing at a rapid rate. So it's really important that you have a little checklist of the allergic rhinitis symptoms. Do you have an itchy, sneezy, runny nose? That's enough. Do you have itchy, sneezy, runny nose? Yes, okay, possible allergic rhinitis. That's a big factor. Do you have any symptoms of allergic disease? So run through what are the other allergic diseases? So think about atopy. Atopy is the, is the um, affiliation of a number of these different allergic diseases starting with eczema, allergic rhinitis, asthma and food allergies. So if you ask whether or not they've got any of those conditions or a family history of those conditions, that's really important. I always screen as well for their ENT history. Have you had any problems with your adenoid? Have you had your adenoid out, tonsils out or any problems with your ears? That's enough. Just three basic questions with the ENT area. Oral issues, that's probably your, your specialty, but I quite often will say, have you seen an orthodontist or had any concerns with a dentist? Um, are you grinding your teeth? They're basic, basic ones that I teach the GPs to use, but I'm sure you've got a better list than that. And very importantly, I always ask how they're doing at school. I want to know if there's any learning or behaviour issues that are already being flagged. I think if you can remember those five key questions, um, I think they usually is enough that that's usually enough to screen patients for the causes of mouth breathing syndrome. Obviously, there's been a number of studies that have looked at what are the best questions or the most effective questions to ask. And um, the proposal for a screening questionnaire for detecting habitual mouth breathing based on a mouth breathing habit score uh, basically said these are the most effective questions. But I noted that they don't have anything to do with allergic rhinitis. And I have to be honest with you, you really do need to ask not so much specifically about do you have a blocked nose, uh, but I think you do need to ask a lot about um, allergic rhinitis as well. Um, certainly, I do feel that their most effective visual assessment uh, of a lack of lip seal is an is a, a, a important one that will give a high probability of, of having mouth breathing syndrome. Posture changes, dark eyes, dark eyes around the circles, the venous pooling, as we've mentioned, long face, the bite problems, the high narrow palate is a given, uh, and uh, gingivitis. So this clues activity, I think, is probably going to be a little bit basic for everybody here, but um, what we might do is, I know we had a lovely orthodontist that volunteered, but I'd love to have another a volunteer just to quickly call out what are some of the features that are staring us in the face here of the dysfunctional breathing that we need to pick up. Open mouth posture. Venous pooling. Venous pooling again. Lower jaws is um, retrognathic. Retrognathic. That's probably blocking the airways. Yep. Short lip, uh, lap, lap seal, lap Short lip, yep, lack of lip seal. Probably quite flat malar. That's pretty good. I think most of that was covered there as well. So this is a, an allergic looking child. So you can see here the obvious allergic shiner, the red conjunctiva. You can't see the allergic nasal crease, but quite often you'll see this crease along the nose where they've done this. And we call that the allergic salute. And you can see in adulthood, they've got this little crease along their nose. That pretty much stays there. And um, quite often, what are we seeing here? <coughs> Big tonsil or hyper, yep, yep. They're quite inflamed tonsils as well. And I don't think it's really given, but dry lips. She's got pretty dry lips. Um, this child here, narrow very narrow palate, yeah. crowded teeth. Yeah. You, you, Per yep, this one's perfect. Anterior tongue thrust. What type of bite? Open bite. 
I think if you are unable to close your 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 lips, yep. then I mean there might be a speech path or an oral myofunctional here. But I think that's actually that that muscle there is just not being used, yeah. which is why they often have to retrain that lip seal. Yeah. They find it really hard to close their lips, yeah. um, and you can see them. They're trying to close their lips, and their chins are wiggling. So and it can be modified. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. They have to be retrained, yeah. and it takes a while, yeah. and that is often missed. That's one of the key critical things that are missed after the operation. They go to the ENT, they get their airway clear, they go to the orthodontist, but then there's this critical miss, and that's the retraining. That's getting that lip seal again. And you can see them, they just weaken the muscles there. So, um, so like I've said before, mouth breathing is nasal obstruction until proven otherwise. So um, when I look at how I work out my, my system, with the, with the nose, Toby always taught me, my partner who's an ENT, he said the nose is really simple. He says it's just a tube. It's just a tube like this. Um, and it can be blocked at the front, it can be blocked in the middle, and it can be blocked at the back. And at the front, it's generally blocked obviously from these big bulky turbinates or a major deviated septum. Um, and obviously allergic rhinitis will cause those turbinates to be enlarged as well. It can be blocked at the middle because of uh, nasal polyposis or chronic rhinosinusitis and generally blocked at the back because of adenoid hypertrophy. They're the commonest causes. And if I were to say, what do I see in, in my practice? I always tell Derek asks me once, he goes, well, what do you reckon is the percentage of these kids that you see at the moment, nasal obstruction being the cause? What, what is the percentage of the causes? And I almost said it's a, it's a third, a third, a third. A third, allergic rhinitis. A third, adenoid hypertrophy. And a third, mixed of allergic rhinitis, adenoid hypertrophy, with a very small percentage of just some deviated nasal septums in there causing the major obstruction. But that's kind of, and I don't, you know, I don't have a, a study to back that. I'm just telling you what my practice is over the, the last couple of years. And I would generally say that there is a growing proportion of what I call this mixed category, and that is allergic rhinitis and adenoid hypertrophy together. Um, so, and that brings us to this growing role of the allergic rhinitis. And this is a bit that I can probably uh, talk, talk, um, talk underwater. <laughs> But I didn't want to spend too much time because I thought this would actually bore everybody. But there is, firstly, there's an increase in airway allergies. That's just a fact, full stop. And the World Allergy Organization, um, you know, in 2015, I think the topic was pollen allergies and the next year it was airway allergies. And they all say the same thing, that the reason airway allergies are increasing is because of a combination of climate change and air pollution, believe it or not. No one wants to know about that. No one wants to talk about that. But there is obviously this environmental factor that's causing pollen allergies potentially to increase as well. So we're seeing a huge amount of airway allergies. And that means that there's more allergic rhinitis, more allergic rhinosinusitis, and more asthma. And unfortunately, allergic rhinitis is kind of what I call the ghost. It's a ghost diagnosis. People don't really want to talk about it, don't think about it, don't really care about it. It's just hay fever. But unfortunately, if you have chronic hay fever, and everyone knows the acute symptoms, each sees runny nose, but when it's chronic and you've had it for a really, really long time, what ends up happening is your nose just blocks, and then you lose the function of your nose. And unfortunately, it's really critical, your nose. For whatever reason, GPs and lots of other health professionals have thought the nose is just decorative, it's just sort of there. But actually, it's got a really vital function. It's the first part of the respiratory system, but it's there to warm the air, filter the air, humidify the air. And if all of a sudden you lose the function of the nose and you breathe with your mouth open, there's, like I said, this cascade of things happen. When you're mouth breathing, your pH of your saliva is going to reduce, which means you've got an increased risk of dental decay and caries. Am I right? Yeah, enamel wear away. Um, the tongue obviously is not sitting in the appropriate position, so you can't sit there. I always tell a patient, you're not going to sit. A child's not going to have their mouth open and put their tongue up at the top of the palate like this. Then the tongue's going to have to hang low. So that low-lying tongue and the absence of that tongue is obviously causing palate changes and that high arch, narrow palate. Um, so the absence of that tongue, and I always remind them, the tongue. This trivia question. Um, the trivia question is, what is the strongest muscle of your body? It's the tongue. So the absence of the tongue on the palate during that vital period of growth means that the, the palate becomes quite high in its arch and narrow, and you get crowded teeth, etc. 
I'm fairly certain all that stuff is what you what you guys know, know a lot more than me about. But what people don't recognise is with allergic rhinitis is that there is often a lot of these chronic complications that are occurring. Number one, the one that I really want to impress upon you, glue ear. And uh, maybe the species might know a little bit more about the glue ear complication, but certainly there is an, a link between allergic rhinitis and a titus media with a fusion of glue ear. And we'll talk about that a little bit, little bit later on. Another complication of the allergic rhinitis is obviously the sleep breathing issue, and it's linked with obstructive sleep apnea and sleep breathing disorder, and obviously asthma. If you've never heard of the atopic march, just let me remind you what it is. The atopic march, in terms of allergy terms, is this sequence of allergic events that occurs. It starts off often in childhood with eczema. So you see these preschoolers with eczema, and they're often quite dust mite sensitized. And then it can roll on towards allergic rhinitis, and it can roll on with food allergies as well to asthma. And that's that march. It's a march of allergic diseases. And unfortunately, what we, what we need to realise is that if we can intervene, particularly at the eczema stage or at the allergic rhinitis stage, we can often stop that roll on. And so it's important that people be aware of that, particularly with allergic rhinitis, because we know that if we actually use immunotherapy, it's the one thing that can actually, in allergic rhinitis, that can actually prevent the ongoing atopic march to asthma. And so it, it, it is important that people are mindful about the option of immunotherapy. Um, there are a lot of people out there with steroid concerns, and I will talk to you about some other options, apart from na nasal steroid sprays. And they're now saying that allergy should be a national priority as a chronic disease, and I couldn't agree with, with that more. So it's not just about food allergy and the anaphylaxis, and by all means, food allergy is increasing. One in 10 preschoolers have a food allergy, but it's the environmental allergy that is very sneaky, and it's sneaking up on us, and it's causing this silent problem of blocked nose. And blocked nose equals mouth breathing syndrome for a lot of these children. So this is a very typical child that I would see in, in the allergy clinic. And just a, a rough story, this, this, this family, um, they've come in because their child, they're a little bit concerned that they've just always got a runny nose. Should we go to the naturopath? They want to build up their immune system. That's a very, a very standard thing that they'll tell me. And the child in front of you gives this allergic salute and you see the eczema. And so you start thinking, well, you know, let me have a little think about allergies instead. Uh, they've just moved into an older style apartment and they're starting to get a lot, they're getting sick quickly and there is visible mould. Mould's a massive killer. I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you that dampness and um, dampness is a huge cause of not so much mortality but morbidity. If there is dampness, there is often mould and there is lots of chronic respiratory illnesses. So if you do have patients with these chronic coughs and things, always think about their home environment and even their occupation, um, it makes a huge difference to find out where they're working and where they're sleeping. Um, and quite often there will be either an issue with dust mite or quite often mould. So, uh, you know, if you're a GP that's trained in this, you can obviously do some tests. The test that we do is a skin prick test, it takes 15 minutes. And this is a basic environmental panel. This is some dust mites and moulds that have been picked up here. Um, generally speaking, there's a huge wait list to get allergy testing done. I don't know if anyone's aware of that, but if you decide you want to send a patient off to get allergy testing through the public hospital system, it could take 12 months. This test is so simple. GPs used to do it all the time. It's a bit of a political issue and why it is that GPs aren't doing it more frequently. And that's not the topic of today's uh, lecture. But it is actually a fairly simple test to be done. And this particular child was being exposed to some mold, showed up that they had a mold allergy. We did a, a nasoendoscopy and guess what, you can't get in anyway. You've got the turbinates touching the septum and there's a very allergic looking turbinate here. So this is a very standard picture. So if a GP decided, no, we're not going to go to the naturopath, but instead we're going to, do, we're going to look into this allergy issue and they've worked out that it was mold and dust mite and they change their home environment and they minimise that exposure, they clean up the mould, they work out why there was mould, it's usually because of some sort of water, water issue. And in this case they had to de dehumidify the house and improve the air quality of the home and we used some steroid nasal spray and the child started to get better. Um, but what I think really saved this child was that the parents decided to go ahead with allergen immunotherapy. And what we may not realise is that 
he may have been one of those kids that have been prevented right there from the development of ongoing to, to get asthma. So I think, um, I think GPs really need to upskill in allergy because I think it's becoming a huge core of a lot of chronic illness. So what's involved if you were to send one of these patients with mouth breathing syndrome to a GP who happens to be upskilled in this area, what's involved in this check? What, what sort of tests or what investigations do we need to be doing to work out if their nose is blocked? Is it just a lateral airway x-ray? Should that be enough? Or is there something else that we should be doing? What exactly are the tests involved? So I've been putting together what's called a medical airway check. I actually made up that term. It's not really a specific term, but that's what I called it. I called it a medical airway check. And a medical airway check was really just the ability of the GP to examine the nose in a very thorough manner, from the front to the back. And not only that, to really assess for allergic rhinitis and to assess for the function in the nose. And at this medical airway check, we're basically putting them on that spectrum of sleep breathing disorders. Is this mouth breathing on its own or is it mouth breathing plus snoring? Um, because that is a separate pathway, a snoring pathway compared to the mouth breathing pathway. If they are mouth breathing, which equals nasal obstruction most of the time, how severe is the nasal obstruction? How can I grade that severity? Then I've got to work out, well, where is the nasal obstruction? Is it at the front of the nose, the middle, or the back of the nose? How can I work that out in 15 minutes? Uh, and then is there an allergic airway? Why does that matter? Well, it changes your management. And not only does it change your management in the short term, but very importantly, changes your management in the long term as well. And are there any comorbidities or complications? So that's the aim of what I'm teaching the GPs at the moment to do in a medical airway check. So these days there is better equipment and it's really only in the last sort of 10 years or so that we've managed to acquire or have access to equipment that can actually do a lot of this testing on the spot, so on the spot diagnostics. So this has really just been a matter of you know, the evolution of time. So what do we do? We use quality of life scores. I'll talk about video nasal endoscopy, rhinomanometry, allergy skin prick testing, tympanometry, and spirometry if there's asthma. So I use a lot of quality of life scores. So if you ever receive a medical airway report from me, you'll see a little section with all the quality of life scores. Why do I use it? Because firstly, I'm, I'm often a little bit lazy and I can't bother asking every single one of those questions and it's really easy to scan it. So if you ever do this area of work, then I encourage you to look into these particular scores. One's the nasal symptom score sheet, which basically looks at the symptoms of allergic rhinitis and grades it. The other is the OSA 18 quality of life score, which really assesses, Rochelle showed me that one and I really like it. It um, basically looks at the um, sleep breathing disorder and whether or not there's a high risk of having obstructive sleep apnea and what their quality of life is like. And obviously asthma symptom scores are well recognised. Video naso endoscopy is, um, is really new. Um, and you know, quite often you'll go to a basic, not a basic, you go to an ENT and they've just got a basic flexible nasal endoscopy which they look in and they can only see what's going on. The video nasal endoscopy means that you show the patient what's going on. And, um, a lot of dentists I think have a lot of these technologies but GPs are pretty behind the time, we don't have this sort of stuff. So this is amazing that I can actually press play and show the patient exactly where the obstruction is. And what I love about it is that we're able to grade quite often, just so you know, that's the back of the inferior turbinate right there, and that's an adenoid that's causing essentially a 100% obstruction of the posterior nasal space. And similarly here, that's the inferior turbinate there with another adenoid causing 100% obstruction of the posterior nasal space. And this one here is just a mucopyrrolin discharge um, beneath the inferior turbinate here from, I think it was someone with a bit of uh, rhinosinusitis. But the, the point here is that patients love to be able to see what's going on. And there's a huge amount of studies that were done that showed that patient uh, satisfaction was very, very high when you use a nasal endoscope. But I find very, very importantly that my compliance rate with medication is incredible when I physically show them where the blockage is and say, well, this is what the situation is. We can do six weeks of nasal steroid spray and try and shrink it because there is evidence that we can actually shrink adenoid hypertrophy with intranasal steroid spray. Or 
Um, so so if, if I show that, show that to them, I find that their compliance is huge because the other option is surgery. And everyone wants a non-surgical option. No one wants to rush to surgery. Very few people will say, no, 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 we'll go for the surgery. Um, they all want to try medical options first. And so physically seeing it always assists with their compliance. So first line treatment, just so you know, for adenoid hypertrophy is what we call the six week nasal steroid challenge. And that is the application of an intranasal steroid at a fairly high dose. I don't, I kind of say to them, look, let's just do it for six weeks and work out. We'll grade it now, that's 100%, you've seen it. Let's come back, we repeat the test and they can see it again. Oh, look, it's 50% now, look, something's working. And then we tailor down their steroid dose. But physically seeing it has, I cannot say it, their patients have engaged so well with nasal endoscopy. It really has been a lot, of, you know, this machine is amazing. It is a $20,000 machine, but it was, it's just so worth it when it comes to um, managing nasal obstruction in a primary care practice. And not only that. Yeah. So I can, we do. In, in our workflow is that we actually do, but, and I'll come to the allergy testing, but just so you know, we don't screen with allergy testing. We only use allergy testing or skin prick testing to confirm an allergen, to confirm if they've got a, an allergy there. So what that means is, and I, I had this discussion with Rochelle the other day because she sent a patient in and, and she said, well, I, I got a letter back, but it said that they didn't get an allergy test. And I thought maybe they would get an allergy test. And I said, well, they didn't get an allergy test because we, we asked them a set of screening questions. Do you have itchy, sneezy, runny nose, a history of eczema or asthma? <coughs> if they don't have any symptoms or signs of allergic rhinitis, then we don't do a skin prick test because it's not a screening tool. Um, but the, 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 the answer to your question is, do, do we do an allergy test before this? In our workflow, yes, we can, if they've got symptoms, um, it's symptoms of allergic rhinitis. Is there an age, sort of uh, minimum yeah. age for this? Yeah, yeah. yeah like I don't, I don't I, look, four, we might get away with doing a nasal endoscope, yeah. um, but certainly no younger, I, I don't do it. I certainly don't. Maybe the ENTs do, but I, I don't feel comfortable. You have to compliance or, or compliance yeah, for me. Yeah. yeah, they just won't sit still. Yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the day, the scope's only going in. You know, I always say to them because they look at you with this big long thing. Oh, what's I mean, it's going in about as far as you pick your nose. You laugh and think, you know, it's only going in that far. So it, it's not that it's going in a huge. We're not going down to the larynx. Yeah. I'm training the GPs basically just to get to the adenoid, to the posterior nasal space. So we're not going very far, but it's just that 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 anterior portion to the posterior nasal space that can give you on the spot information about nasal obstruction that's just so critical because I can work out where what path I'm going to go on. You know, we've got a, a very, um, at the end of the day, most patients, unless they've got red flag signs, uh, will be put on a medical challenge. And that medical challenge is generally Nasonex, cheap, nasty, over the counter, but you know, I still put it on a script to make it look important. Uh, but I'll give them a Nasonex challenge, which is two sprays in the morning, in each nostril and two sprays in the evening in each nostril. That's a fairly good dose. Um, mind you, Nasonex has a very low absorption rate, 0.001% uh, is absorbed in, in the bloodstream. So I'm not particularly concerned about you know, um, you know it, it being a high dose of a steroid for a short period of time. I'm, I'm quite happy because it really tells me, is this patient steroid sensitive or not? If they're steroid sensitive and the adenoid reduces in size, then there's a good chance we're not going to go towards surgery and I don't need to refer to the ENT. If, however, I come back and that adenoid is still 100% obstructive and they've done the spray and nothing's shifted, then the parents are very happy to see an ENT and they feel satisfied that they've tried things that were medical first. So I think it is a um, video nasal endoscopy uh, in a primary care workforce, wrong one, primary care workforce, I think has been a total, oh, look, there's a video, a total game changer. So that's just the adenoid sitting at the back. Uh, well, anyway, that was the adenoid sitting at the back, obviously. Rhinomanometry is another test. So we're still going through what's in the medical airway check. Rhinomanometry, has anyone heard of rhinomanometry before? Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, they took the Medicare rebate away last year for this, which was a bit of a bummer. But I absolutely insisted that this test was really critical for GPs when they assess in the nose. Um, because what we tend, so we just charge a $35 consumables fee for this. Um, because I really want to keep doing it. I don't want to uh, abandon it just because Medicare has 
said that GPs can't claim this item number. But what it basically gives, gives me is information, particularly about the degree of nasal obstruction and how much nasal resistance there is. And straight away, I can kind of work out is this surgical or medical, just looking at those numbers. But very importantly, what we tend to do is then do a before and after at the six week challenge. So they've come in at their initial assessment, we've done their quality of life scores, I've got a baseline rhino manometry to look what their nose looks like, I've gone in and I've assessed it, and then when they come back six weeks later, after they've done their medical challenge, I have repeat rhino manometry side by side, quality of life scores and repeat nasal endoscopy that I can see if things have improved or not. So it's a very systematic way of examining and then re-examining their airway to see is this an airway that is medically appropriate to treat or do I then need to send it to the ENT? Does this need to go to surgery? Do they need turbinates to be <coughs> reduced? Do they need their septum to be fixed, very unlikely in the child? Do they need their adenoid removed? Or do they have any comorbidities like blue ear, for instance? And this is to the allergy testing now. There are two ways you can obviously allergy test. You can do a blood test. The government gives you four free tests on Medicare. So you could do, for instance, grass, dust mites, and mold, and some, and some animal dander. And so, so for example, that's a, that's a bulk bill panel. And, but unfortunately, it's not as sensitive and specific as doing a skin prick test. ASCIA, which is our college, the allergy college, has said that the skin prick testing is the gold standard. Tympanometry, if you haven't ever seen this before, is the quickest way. I've, I mean, I love this timp. This timp is now my, one of my favorite tools. Um, and basically what it does is in two seconds can tell me if there is an effusion or gluey in, for, for a child. And as I've mentioned before, allergic rhinitis and adenoid hypertrophy, which I think is the next slide, always go to the wrong one. Um, I'm, I'm actually uh, really passionate about gluey in children. I think it's often underdiagnosed and really and missed. Um, and it's actually the most frequent cause of childhood hearing loss. It's a huge issue, particularly in the Aboriginal community. And one of my um, passions was doing this project where I was upskilling GPs to do video otoscopy, that is with the video to look in the ear to send a picture to an ENT and doing the tympanometry. And we can on the spot diagnose if that kid needs a, it needs a grommet with tele-ENT or tele-otolaryngology. So um, I think that GPs can be doing so much more in the community just with some simple upskills with some new equipment. Honestly, just need some upgraded equipment. But there is a silent impact of glue ear in the classroom and you should be mindful, big adenoid, allergic rhinitis, think ears. Think glue ear as a possibility, particularly around winter time. Um, that's when it tends to strike. So the medical airway check, if you ever send a patient in to see one of our, our GPs, takes about an hour. We do the history, we do the rhinomanometry, we do skin prick testing if necessary, nasoendoscopy and examination and work out what is the cause here, what am I treating exactly. So in terms of complications, we need to think about all the contiguous structures. So we're going to just quickly look at describing the potential consequences of having a blocked nose on these particular structures here. So if you want to yell out, just, just a basic, just two words, three words. What might be some effects of a blocked nose on the brain? Sleep. Great. Poor sleep, lower IQ, potentially if they're snoring. John Hopkins University had a, an article that came out that showed that if that IQ points were lowering with obstructive sleep apnea. So if they're snoring and mouth breathing, then it can actually affect their IQ and their potential. Uh, dental and ADHD, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, dental complications, I think that one we probably would cover. Someone just yelled out a complication of the jaw from a blocked nose. Part of the long face. What about um, narrow TMJ issues, potentially? Bruxism, potentially as well? Uh, tongue? Low, lying tongue, poor posture, tongue thrusting. Palate, we know to death. Ears, we've mentioned the glue ear. Speechies, what happens with speech and swallow? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. They're all fair, fair. Oh, you guys know it all. I'm pretty certain I haven't contributed very much here. Lungs, asthma, tonsils, big tonsils. 
Okay, that's all pretty pretty straightforward. But um, as mentioned before, we have to realise that a lot of these conditions are often overlap as well. This is probably one of my favourite articles. Uh, so if you haven't already read, read it, then this one here by uh, Josh Jefferson, Mouth Breathing, Adverse Effects on Facial Growth, Health, Academics and Behaviour, is probably one that I would say is a compulsory read. And um, he pretty much sums it all up. And he explains not only the physical reasons how you know a blocked nose causes the abnormal facial features, but very importantly, he's actually looked at uh, what are the adverse effects on uh, academics and behaviour. And he references this particular article, which I found really fascinating, which is that people who are breathing through... Because the thing with mouth breathing, if you check the oxygen levels, a mouth breather and someone who's breathing through their nose, their oxygen levels are the same. So one would think, okay, well, why is it they seem to be oxygenating the same? But then when they looked at actually with these, these special infrared spectroscopy scans and they looked at the deoxy hemoglobin, they found that mouth breathers had an increase in the deoxy hemoglobin and nasal breathers had a decreased deoxy hemoglobin. And that this was, and that there was no statistically significant difference in the oxy hemoglobin. And they believed that that this change in the in their root was in, in their in their breathing root was causing an increase in the oxygen load in the prefrontal cortex, which could be giving central fatigue and a possible rise of or possible explanation of the ADHD symptoms that occur with mouth breathing. So we know that there's ADHD that's linked to obstructive sleep apnea, but no one's ever really been able to explain why mouth breathers may potentially have um, some of these ADHD symptoms as well. I'm always pressing the wrong button. And obviously there's a critical window of opportunity in the developing child. We know that by the age of uh, 12, 90% of their facial growth has already occurred and that that's why early intervention is critical. And I've mentioned before the importance of treating the allergy potentially with immunotherapy to prevent the march to asthma and the potential as well for their IQ points if they happen to be snoring. So I think that somebody asked once before whether or not they should treat the uh, orthodontics when, when should we treat the orthodontics? When should we clear the nose? Should we wait to treat the orthodontics first? Should you clear the nose? The whole process. And I say treat everything as quickly as you can is the answer. So if, uh, if, um, if Derek's doing a, an expansion, I'm, I'm clearing the nose at the same time. I'm not waiting for the expansion. I think they should be all occurring concurrently is, is, my, is my answer to it all. Because at the end of the day, early intervention, it's, it's critical. Timing is critical here. I'll just run very quickly through allergy management because I think we're, we're getting close to maybe shifting to the activities. Um, but um, allergy management really depends on a number of things. It really depends on what they're allergic to, obviously, and how severe their allergies are. People's allergies often can be just infrequent. They can have seasonal allergies. And some people can have perennial, which is all year round allergies. And they can also be quite chronic. So we use like, a basic step up approach. If their allergies are fairly infrequent, allergen minimization strategies may be sufficient and some antihistamines may be all that you need. If, however, they've got quite regular allergies and their allergies are there most of, most of their, most days, then we generally will start using an approach with not only allergen minimization strategies, but nasal steroids are usually my first line approach. In terms of alternative treatments, one of my favourite ones that I would like to talk to you about is the UV phototherapy. Has anyone heard of the Rhinolite before? Because we use it a lot at Australian Allergy Centre. And I know Derek refers a lot of patients for the Rhinolite because it's something that's different. There's a lot of parents out there who have steroid phobia. And I think rightly so. Because a lot of these allergic kids happen to be, you know, they happen to also have eczema and asthma. And so steroids have become part of their life. They've got new steroid inhaler, they've got steroid creams, they've got lots of steroids. So parents are trying their best to find some other strategy to manage their uh, allergies. The Rhinolite is not first line treatment, I'll make that clear. I use it as a second line treatment or for patients who don't tolerate steroids or simply need what's called a steroid holiday. And a steroid holiday is a break from using the steroids so much because steroids over a prolonged period of time can cause problems. There is no denying that, particularly for these children or adults who are using multiple steroids. UV phototherapy has been used for psoriasis or a skin condition for a long time. It's an anti, it has an anti-inflammatory action. 
They worked out and there's evidence for it that if you use this UV phototherapy, which is a mixture of UVA, UVB, natural light in the nose, it deactivates a cell in the nose called the mast cell, which is what releases histamine on exposure to an allergen. It deactivates that cell for up to 12 months, giving hay fever relief. So if patients are considering or looking for a non-pharmaceutical option or a natural alternative, then light can offer that hope. So these treatments are very accessible. We charge $55 per treatment. They get back a Medicare rebate of $38 because it's a medically supervised treatment. So it's 12 bucks or so per treatment. There's eight treatments for the course. So it can often cost them out of their pocket about $100 to give them 12 months of allergy relief. So I do, you know, I put a brochure in your uh, folders about rhinolite. So if you have patients that have got allergic rhinitis, don't want steroid nasal sprays, don't want antihistamines, then just saying, you know what, maybe you could consider an alternative approach, then out of all of them, rhinolite is one that I would recommend. Acupuncture has also got some um, good growing evidence for its use as well. Um, and I'm actually a big believer in essential oils. So I often will have a complimentary program with essential oils. And I teach a lot of my patients about um, uh, lymphatic drainage, sinus massage, acupressure points, etc. Because I think all those things, as a GP, I kind of need to put a program or a challenge together that involves more than just medicines. <laughs> it's not just about medicines. So allergic allergen minimization strategy runs through a whole lot of ways uh, to not only minimize their exposure, but to incorporate some non-pharmaceutical methods. Immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is worth mentioning as well quickly. Immunotherapy is when we desensitize someone from an allergen. So if you have patients with dreadful allergic rhinitis, it, you can potentially offer them a cure. So this is not always suitable for everyone. There are some people that are allergic to so many things, they're polyallergic, I can't desensitize them against everything. But if they've got a very specific allergen that they're allergic to, for example, dust mite, or perhaps their cat, then offering immunotherapy can really be a godsend. So you can give them the injections, which are um, monthly for up to three years, uh, or you can do a sublingual approach for children over the age of five. And nowadays there's even a dust mite tablet that's available for GPs to order straight from the pharmacy that's been available over the last two years. So immunotherapy is more of a curative approach and it's got evidence to prevent them from requiring any medication after they've completed the course for up to 30 years. So this is a typical walking case in general practice, a hyperactive kid. And normally most GPs would just refer straight for a developmental assessment. But I always teach my GPs now to start thinking about sleep and start thinking about hearing. Because if they are snoring, <clears throat> there is no safe level of snoring in a child. If they're snoring or mouth breathing, it really warrants a workup because ADHD symptoms or hyperactivity may in fact be a, a symptom of mouth breathing syndrome. So in this particular airway check, we looked at their tonsils, they're massive. We looked at the back of the nose, there is a 90% obstructive adenoid. We did a rhinomanometry test that showed they had bilateral nasal obstruction. We did a quality of life score, it showed they had a high impact in their quality of life. So for a GP who had this patient walk in and within 20 minutes to be able to tell them, look, I think that this may be the route that we need to go down rather than just sending you to this specialist, it can really make a huge difference to a lot of patients. So ADHD can totally remove someone's uh, two, um, adenoid and two tonsils there. Um, and, and think about how big they are. They're blocking a child's airway. I mean, there's no oxygen getting to their developing brain. So um, the general protocol is that we try always steroid nasal sprays unless there's a red flag side of a critical airway obstruction. In this particular case, the six-week spray didn't do anything and um, they had a, obviously adenotonsillectomy, which they were very grateful for. So one of the last C's, care, is the coordinated response. We'll whip through this now because I think we've managed to talk about everything. So uh, as mentioned before, there are a number of health professionals that we need to involve in the care of these children. And I think we've kind of worked out now that GPs being able to do a medical airway check um, can save patients a huge amount of travel, can reduce the Medicare footprint, and can also give them the option to access tests 
which, you know, an allergy test, for instance, which can be done in the GP's office, nasal endoscopy done in the GP's office, it just means less expensive, you know, um, less expenses, essentially, uh, and, and, and an ability for the GP to coordinate their care. So I think that there is huge, huge benefits, and I'm, I'm so proud of all the GPs that I've upskilled and trained that can actually do this work. And it really only takes them six months of training because what it does is it really puts the patient into what's called the medical home. I think we'll skip through this because I think it's probably, we're talking about asthma here. So why don't we go through and have a little stretch, maybe. Um, and we're just going to finish in the last 15 minutes. We're almost done. Um, we're going to do the activity. So if you open up your activity sheet. Almost there. Yeah. They're not too restless. How amazing is this? Oh, I feel like you guys actually know a lot of this stuff. I, I feel very like I'm repeating it. Does everyone have an activity book? Everyone have an activity list? Oh, good. Oh, I've got some here. Oh, I got no one. I have one. So, that's it. You've got it. That's it. Mouth breathing syndrome in children. So, who doesn't have one? Because who doesn't have one? This one here. So, this is kind of an introduction to. How? One more. Everyone got one? One more here. Gentry, I've been in your way the entire time. Have my back here. Special treatment for this, Gent. Yeah, let's get on with it. Alina. Susie, can you take one? Can we grab one more of the mouth breathing? You got heat? Most people do. They've all got heat. Who recognised in that side presentation half their patients? Thank you. Yep. Yeah, this one, this one didn't have it. It doesn't have to be done. Those some didn't have it. Oh, I need one more. This is the last one. Yeah. Did you miss out? If you missed out. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, they got to get this. So this is really just to try and put together the 5C approach uh, to consolidate everything that we've just covered. And I don't think they're particularly hard cases, and I know that you've got to just do this at the back, you know, really, really quickly. But if you could just partner up, we'll run through... Um, wrong one, I'm always doing the same thing. Okay, so the first case I think was the, is... Uh, so basically the, the, there is the cases, and then you'll have the, just the answer sheets. Yeah, the question sheet is exactly the same for all three cases. So the first case is this child here, clinical scenario one. The preschooler that we saw at the beginning, possibly another cold, I don't know. Could this just be another daycare cold or could this be something else? He's five, he's getting recurrent urties, no allergies, no medications, but he's had recurrent otitis media or ear infections requiring antibiotics. So... Um, if you want to just next to your partner, there's a series of questions. It should, it should be directly afterwards. Yep. So the, the first thing is there's a medical airway check. So if you look at the medical airway check, I'm not sure how well it can be seen. Probably black and white wasn't the best. Wing it. Can you see? That's right. So this guy, this child's not snoring. He's definitely got some mouth breathing. But if you compare it to one of the other quality of life later, which is a snoring child, this one's only a very low moderate. Okay, so you can see there that one. And honestly, I often will just glance at it and look at some of the key questions. But it, it really does help. 
And just so you know that tympanometry, um, obviously you haven't been trained to interpret it, uh, but the tympanometry is abnormal. And how do I know that? So that's the tymp, sorry, can I just use that? That's the tympanometry there. Um, really a quick way to work it out. The peak has to be inside the box. So the fact that the peak is not inside the box is a type B tympanogram, which tells me that there is fluid in the ear, behind the ears. So, um, and in terms of the picture, that was meant to show an adenoid, about a 100% obstructive adenoid, sitting in the posterior nasal space. But I have put the nasoendoscopic report there, um, which is how we get our GPs to describe what they're seeing in a systematic fashion. the non-allergic rhinitis component, we do. So the, I didn't, I didn't, you know what, I didn't know exactly what to speak about tonight, but. I'm, I'm exactly the same, but it's, well, I'm very similar to you, and in fact, it's also chemical sensitivity as well. So when we do the examination, and it looks allergic, or they have allergic symptoms, and the allergy test is negative, where then there is a proportion of patients with non-allergic rhinitis, I then go through, sometimes it can be just, um, it can actually be just you know, dreadful air pollution, so often screening to see if they live next to train stations or uh, main roads are really important. And then I do look at diet, and the first thing I go for is dairy free first, uh, for two weeks trial, and then add it back in again to see if there's a relapse, and then I will often consider gluten free as well. But I'm with you 100%, you didn't mention that. Some of them also have issues with that, and more in adulthood rather than children. Um, the non-allergic rhinitis component, they often will have issues with um, fragrances. Often you I ask them about wine, that'll be a good screening question. You know, do you have any issues with sulfite sensitivity? You know, do you have a runny nose, etc. And then I start going through all the other chemical sensitivities, occupational rhinitis, etc. Et but the non-allergic rhinitis proportion is actually growing. I agree with you, there is there is a food element, I didn't include it much today. It doesn't it doesn't show up. It, it's not that it's not an IgE mediated food allergy. So it doesn't it, it, even if I did skip fruit test, I'd be wasting their money and wasting their time. It doesn't show up. It's actually more of a um, uh, it's possibly the mechanism they think is for IgG, it's more of a food intolerance effect that's well, causing it. So <laughs> it can't be tested with an elimination diet. To be fair, I would basically get a, I, I'm an anti dairy anyway, but a lot of them will have glue ear, and the ones with glue ear often will say, you know. I don't have huge evidence for it, but as an integrative doctor, I do encourage them to stay off dairy. I, I was going to put it at no. No, most of them have got, and most of them have got, I believe, have a structural issue and have allergic rhinitis. What, I would, if I was going to put a number, maybe five to That would be my guess, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, no, I, I, you know, that's a good point. I think I should mention a bit more about food. Honestly, I'm, I'm, it's very hard to work out what it is that I was going to talk about tonight. <laughs> okay, um, I'm looking for a wonderful volunteer. All right, I don't, I, I'm, I'm just gonna go like this. Okay, so first impression, describe the five clues just from five, first glance that indicates mouth breathing syndrome. I would love a speech pathologist to stand up. A speech pathologist representative, I'm not picking on you, I just know that you're a different dis, interdisciplinary professional. Jolene? They're all in the front oh. row. They're all in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> quick list, quick list. 
pretty easy. Yay! Don't be frightened. Yeah. 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 So, looking at it, I was straight away drawn to open mouth posture. Perfect. Um, for lip seal, it looks like potentially have a um, upper tie. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, good call. Um, just like the jaw positioning being lower down. Yep. Um, I'm going to go on top of the that's, 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 that's probably roughly about five. That's great. Does anyone have anything else they want to add? Teeth? Yeah. Roll forward and also probably the neck as well. Yep. Great. Perfect. Five out of five, ten out of ten, etc., etc. All right, clinical history. Uh, list five questions in what you think would be a priority of importance that you would want to ask to elicit mouth breathing syndrome. Good question. My first question I want to grade it. I want to see is this how severe is this? Is this obstructive sleep apnea at this spectrum or is it just mouth breathing? So does he snore? I think is brilliant. Great. Good first question. 100%. As a speech, I'd want to know if you That's a good question to ask. That's open mouth, I suppose. And we also want to know is the mouth open during the day as opposed to, you know, if a child's mouth is open during the day versus just at night, it's serious, it's more severe. You know, if they are unable to close their mouth during the day, then they're definitely not going to close their mouth at night. Um, any other contributing questions? Anyone thought of allergy symptoms? Yep. Anything else? Behaviour. Behaviour, great. I think we've run through all those key five key questions anyway. Fabulous. So what is their behaviour like? How are they doing at school? Just a simple screening test. You just ask that question and all of a sudden the parent will say, well, oh, they could be doing a lot better actually. They're not really concentrating very well and then it all starts coming out. So you just, all you need is those key questions to ask and you'll be surprised how much information you'll get out of the parent really, really quickly. All right, so medical airway check. We've had a kind of look at the, at the information that was given. Who, what's the most likely cause of the mouth breathing syndrome based on those results? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's it, adenoid hypertrophy. And do you think that there may be some associated complications? What sort of complications would you list? And what would, what would be the consequences at this stage if we didn't address any of those? I could hear the back corner that's murmuring. A little bit louder. Obviously the orthodontic. All those things you said. Yeah, it is. It's it's kind of a bit like that, isn't it? Yeah. It's all those things we've said. I know. I, I recognise it's a little bit repetitive. Perfect. So they're all the orthodontic issues. We need to definitely get to that. And I think the one that I was trying to get everyone to pick up was the um, the glue ear, as well. So that would definitely affect their development. A child that cannot hear properly. Uh, and that's associated, remember, glue ear is associated with adenoid hypertrophy and allergic rhinitis. And uh, if they're not hearing properly and it's not picked up on, then that can really put them back at school as well. And such a simple fix. Such a simple fix. Often they just need grommets. Okay. Um, and going through the... Sorry, I've taken your thing. Uh, going, completing the table, describing the care. Um, what sort of health professionals in this particular case would we need involved? GP, thank you, thank you. I don't think anyone was going to think of the GP. Yeah, I think, look, the GP, look, we're the master of everything and master of nothing at the same time, aren't we? But what we can do is facilitate the care and at least coordinate the care to the right people. So you do need a central place. So, yep, the GP, good point. A and T, obviously, role and responsibility here is to clear the airway surgically if they've failed medical treatment. Uh, we've cleared the airway, there's no allergy, that's fine, they're sleeping well, but they maybe have a little bit of an open mouth posture. Who might be involved now? Psychiatrist. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I think so. Um, okay, so that's probably the speech or 
or a myofunctional. Um, there are some speech pathologists that have a very good interest and know a lot about tongue thrusting and, and, the, and the lip seal, etc. But my go-to at the moment has been the RMI functional therapist, but there have been some fabulous speech pathologists that have, that have done some good work in this area too. All right. Does anyone want to wrap it up? Or should we... So, for example, if the child is really strong and they don't want to take the out the tonsils out, they still have got sleep to that. I mean, not the kids. I, I'm, I've been taught by Dr. Pinkock, and Dr. Pinkock really, pretty much doesn't use a sleep study because if they're snoring, then the gold standard is that no tonsillectomy if they've failed steroid challenge. We tend to use a sleep study if they've had, for instance, if they're in that grey zone of parent not wanting it and we need a bit more time to buy to confirm it, or if they've had an adenotonsillectomy and they're still snoring, that's when I'll use a sleep study. But if they're snoring, they need their airway cleared. So I recognise so that. I'm always fighting with <laughs> I, I recognise that, and there are some that will say that there's benign snoring and not to worry, and then you go in and you see this massive bad noise. So I think if they've got complications orofacially and they're snoring, airway needs to be cleared. A sleep study, useful, but it's not going to really, it's just buying you some time, and I think it's just an, an extra step. I prefer to use the sleep study for those indeterminate cases uh, or for those that have, that have uh, are complicated, you know, and have failed out no tonsillectomy and still snoring. But that's, a, that's obviously controversial. I'm a GP, I'm not an ENT, I'm not a sleep physician, but that's, that's pretty much what my experience has been. So I, I agree there's a bit of, there's a, there's a, there's a huge conflict. I, I, I will agree there. Yeah. 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 By the way, you haven't met. The second best orthodontist in Australia, <laughs> Irene Bomber. Is it Irene? Irene's been doing expansion when I was still in nappies. <laughs> <laughs> and she does it really well. If I needed orthodontics, I'd go to Irene. <laughs> but someone took out my premolars, unfortunately. I snore like a trojan. Yeah. So there you go. Sorry. No, she's, she's been awesome. Um, I'm, co I'm conscious that this has been a little, maybe a little bit repetitive. Do you, do you want to, should we just wrap it up? I think we might wrap it up. So the other thing I like to Question. mention, I like to mention is that if the children do have the adenoids taken out and they don't breathe through the nose, those adenoids will regrow. Oh, that's so important to know. I think that that... Parents will say, oh, they've had the adenoids out of this and this don't want looking. No, 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 yeah. you need to, and a step x-ray is, very, very conclusive to show you that posterior. Um, posterior. That, I think that was that was actually the third case we were going to get to that. And one of the questions was, could an adenoid regrow? Absolutely. And what is the factors that affect regrowth? So the third case was this typical child here who's had his adenoid and tonsils out, okay, but he's still mouth breathing and snoring. And the question yeah, yeah, that the question raised was, can the adenoid regrow? Yes. yes. The risk factors that I'm aware of are. The earlier age of the removal of the adenoid, so say three or four, the extent of the size, if it was for obstructive sleep apnea, it was a large adenoid, that's a risk factor. Allergic rhinitis, major risk factor, and gastroesophageal reflux risk factor as well. So they're the main reasons for the re for the risk of, for regrowth. And I will all I most very, very commonly will say that the adenoid has regrown, maybe not to hundred percent obstructive, but to about eighty percent. So I think it's a it's extremely important uh, note. I wasn't so aware that it's because they're not necessarily breathing through the nose. However, definitely allergic rhinitis has got a huge role to play with the adenoid regrowth. Back in the old days uh, Removal of adenoids was a blind procedure, literally. They weren't visualising what they are doing, so they'd sort of go in there, feel around and, and pull, almost like if you pull a weed or a mushroom and you don't leave the root behind, that, that's a check. Now they use um, uh, scopes, so they actually see what they're doing. They're using um, what's called collabulator or lobulator. Oh, oh no, that's so cool. <laughs> they, use, they use that like a, almost like a high-speed suction uh, as they cut and cauterize, so they actually get right to the and what's the one condition that they wouldn't remove all the adenoid pack? And I mean, you can't answer this one. Yeah. <laughs> there's one. There's one condition. This is for a free bottle of wine from Jacob's Creek. <laughs> You're not allowed to answer. Right. My <laughs> well, what's the one indication where you actually don't want to remove all the adenoids? 
for, I'll help you, for fear, they, they end up with an oroantral fistula. So they end up with you know, mucus going in their mouth and food going through their nose, if you remember. Hmm? You might see acute uvula. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. That's the dead. Thank you. Susie. Sorry. Any more tips for them? <laughs> so you see a bifid uvula. <laughs> Give a sound bite. Alright. It's called VCF. Yeah. Now who can answer what VCF is? I can't actually. <laughs> but, 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 I don't know. I don't know what the VCF is. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So Sorry. Um, it's called the Georges syndrome. So you Google. George's the, syndrome. Yeah, he's the guy who developed it. So these kids, um, they're almost like a, uh, a cleft, but not a full cleft. So you've got to be careful with those kids not to remove all the So they will need an adenectomy revision. But other than that, uh, yeah, well, I agree with Irene. Um, is it called sucking cleft? Correct. And they've got a cleft in their heart, but not those. If you're a no, mouth they're breather. very disguised, you'll be very careful with them. And when you look at their palate, you'll find that the shape of the palate is sort of asymmetrical, very asymmetrical. You know you're dealing with something that's quick. So, yeah. so bifid uvula, yeah. the, the thing, but just if you Google or someone emails me, I'll send you all the thing. That's the one you've got to kind of look for. Um, and I totally agree with Irene. After an nose and throat doctor has done their job, that doesn't mean the kid is automatically going to become a nasal breather. Who would agree? We teach, our, we teach our kids how to walk, we teach them how to talk, we've got to teach them how to breathe through their nose. And that's where this whole, did you mention like MFT and all that sort of thing? My functional yeah. therapy, it yeah. was mentioned. Comes in, comes in. Yeah. I'll spend more time on that one next time. That's, I think, any other questions? Because I think that it's all pretty much just the other thing is that you can actually use tape. If you've done everything and you know that the child can breathe the nose, yep. you can take their mouth, yep. do it in the afternoon, and then slowly do a desire to encourage them to breathe the nose. Yeah, once we've, I agree with Irene. Micro take. We normally, if we've repeated the rhinomanometry and I know that they can breathe through the nose and I've looked and examined it and I can say, look, that airway is quite patent, that adenoid's not huge, so you can get air in here, then I agree with Irene. Sometimes that is part of that habitual retraining. Tape or lip glue is another, is another option, but I think you have to make sure that the parent knows that you know that everyone knows that the nose is clear. <laughs> Otherwise, no one wants to know that they're taping the child's mouth and they're going to suffocate. We're not going to talk about gaffer tape, right? Although you could run. I tried that on all my stuff. If you take a procedure for nasal rebreathing, yeah. It's called micro talk. It's going to change the way they breathe through their brain centers. Yeah. 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 Micropore. Yeah. Micropore. 3M. It's a breathable bandage. So they can still breathe through it. And you don't have to kind of do that, right? I just want a little bit there is enough, right? Now, if, um, you know, you've got a beard like mine or you're Greek female or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you may not want to be able to use the microphone, you know, because of hair, you got that bit, you know, don't you? No! Only the chicks got it. Yeah. <laughs> so you need a thing called Sleep Angel, have you heard of that? Yeah. It's made of uh, the same material as a uh, uh, wetsuit, and they put it around, and then basically it holds your chin that way, so they, they're they not taping the kid or, you know, freaking out, but it works really well. Yeah. Yep. Okay, have a drink. What a great lecture. <laughs> um, do we have any, uh, any, any questions for Susie, myself, Irene? Any, any questions at all? No, none at all.
charge for the allergy testing now, Definitely. small out-of-pocket charge for the brand immunometry, otherwise everything else is bulk filled. And we want to make allergy tests, we want to make it as accessible as possible, that was the whole point. Whereabouts in Roselands is it? Uh, it'll be in the, um, the, 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 the centre. Yeah, it's a new Yeah, yeah. I remember Rosens as a kid. It was I do. amazing. Well, that was the first shopping centre, Joe. These are the kids that are thing up the top. <laughs> Any other questions? Other, 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 other. Right. Well, thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, keep in touch with um, Katholiki over there uh, for the next seminar. Again, the theme for this year is all about um, improving overall health, trial sleep, and their breathing. Uh, so we have a respiratory physician, uh, Jim Papadopoulos speaking next. He's amazing, right? And uh, has anyone worked with Jim before? Yeah. Like, like he's, he really is good. Um, it took me a long time to figure out why some kids, with everything we've done, still don't have good sleep. And then um, we realised um, that if your mouth breathes, uh, your smooth muscle doesn't work properly. And one of the biggest side effects of that is constipation in the child. Constipation leads to gastric reflux. And that's the solid epidemic that really disrupts their sleep. But unless you do a proper sleep study, you don't figure that out, right? So Jim's going to go through, you know, all those cases that you think you've done everything right, but why have they failed? And he, he's a truly amazing. Uh, so after T's and A's are being done, and you know, the kid still is mouth breathing, and still has rest of sleep, and still wets their bed, uh, and blah, blah, blah. You know, so please, Cathy, the date for that is? Do you have a lecture? Sorry? Thank you, Jim. Sorry to wake you. Um, <laughs> oh, I've got it here. Now, if I was the practice manager, I'd be putting in everyone's satchel just quietly. But, um, <laughs> but seeing I'm not the practice manager. 12th of November. What? 12th of November. 12th of November. Now, if, if you come here, you'll, you'll see like a ground zero. Right? <laughs> Uh, so we'll tell you exactly where it is. It'll probably be in something like um, Trades or something like that. A lot, lot of patients? Trades in the shop. Where are you going to see patients? <laughs> where am I going to see patients? Um, I'm, I'm uh, leasing some rooms up here. Correct. So while Ground Zero is here. So 12th of November, we will let you know exactly where it is. Uh, that's great, great, um, great speech. Yeah, and along the same uh, line. Good. Good. Well, thank you very much. Your CPC, CPD certificate um, will be emailed to you if you have the correct email. So check with Joanne, your agenda. Joanne um, will make sure that's the case. And um, uh, we have these lectures, if you like them and you're willing to travel outside the Shire, right? Um, we have these lectures at all practices uh, three times a year. So if you do your maths, it's 12 every year. Um, uh, the next one is in my neutral bay rooms and it fe features Dr. Uh, Gillian Dunlop, who's an uh, nose and throat uh, specialist, and she'll be talking about what she does. Uh, you, know, doesn't, you don't have to be in Neutral Bay to come, we we'll welcome anyone, but just register early because it gets quite busy. Neutral Bay is my brand new practice, it holds 100 people in the waiting room because we have a staff room that we just open the door, the waiting room and the staff room combined, and so it's just amazing sort of um, set up. Hopefully what this place will look like um, in, in the future, right? So please let me know by email. Yeah. Or, or Kathy, Can Kathy like email those all through? So again? Can Kathy email those? Every well, or, or in theory, that? yes. yes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I wouldn't hold so my breath. Clean the day. <laughs> <laughs> personally, uh, personally, my experience over 30 years. Have you met Kathy? Yeah. Huh? Email the busiest guy in the room, and you probably get a response. That's what I <laughs> Every one of these people got an email. Yes, they give you such a hard time. No, I mean, the other, maybe the other. <laughs> The other one, Kathy. For the other ones, the other ones. Today? Huh? you know the other ones in the um, like yeah. oh, the neutral bay yeah. ones. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.